Hello, and welcome back to another one of Dr. Monroe's material science videos. In this video, we're going to be discussing ceramic crystal structures. And we're going to be under trying to understand the difference between the FCC, BCC, HCP, and simple cubic structures that we find in metals, and why ceramics are different from those. So in order to begin answering this question, we need to go back to basics. And we need to go back to bonding. So the types of bonding that we see in ceramics are either ionic or they're covalent. So in an ionic bond, these bonds are non-directional. and they're made between positively and negatively charged atoms or ions. In covalent bonding, we have directional bonding. And so the bond hybridization that's created from covalent bonding will force uh, them to interact with atoms only at very specific angles um, with respect to other atoms. And we'll discuss that in a moment. So um, because of this weird um, type of bonding or this different type of bonding compared to metals, we will get more complicated crystal structures. So the reason that they're more complicated is that you will have um, this directionality or non-directionality uh, between ionic and covalent bonds. You will also have different atomic sizes. So because you need to have two dissimilar elements in order to get an ionic bond, we don't have pure atoms, or pure elements. And therefore, we're going to have spheres that have different sizes. And that's going to play a role in um, the crystal structures that are created. We will also see that charge balance is a huge issue. So um, ceramics aren't positively or negatively charged electrically at the macroscopic scale. And that's because the individual atoms and ions um, congregate in such a way so that you have charge neutrality. You have just as many positive charges as negative charges, and therefore there's net no net charge on the system. So kind of moving on to ionic bonding. So when you have an ionic bond, you have two dissimilar elements. And one of them is positively charged, and the other one is negatively charged. Now, the negatively charged ions, the anions, will be larger than the positively charged ions. And that's because we have uh, electrons that have moved from one atom to another. And therefore, the, um, the, lar the more electrons, the larger the atoms appear, or the ions appear. And so because we have different sized spheres, we're going to have different packing structures, or different, um, we're going to pack them in a different way than we would atoms. So we don't have these close packed structures of all the same sphere size. We have different structures. And so if we had, let's say, you know, three big atoms, these are negatively charged ions, there is a space in between these three atoms. And that's enough space for a positively charged ion to sit. And if this ion gets bigger, in relation to these large, uh, these, if this positively charged ion gets bigger in relation to these negatively charged ions, the packing around them is going to change. So the size or the relative size of the positive to negatively charged ions is going to change the crystal structure. And um, 
a rule of thumb, and this is in your book, is that the um, the small anions or the 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 anions that are you know they're bigger, the small cations on the inside, if they're smaller than that hole, it's an unstable system. If they are touching that hole, it's a stable system. And if they're larger, a little bit larger, it's still stable, but you might be able to pack more um, anions around that cation. And so um, from your book, we have this big table. And the um, kind of cation anion ra radius ratio um, we do or we determine by taking the cation radius and dividing it by the anion radius. And if we take this number and plug it into this table over here, we will be able to see whether or not we have kind of, um, one, ion, one anion two anions and one cation, three anions and two and one cation. For ionic bonding, we're going to have two different sized ions. So the negatively charged ions are going to be larger. The anions are going to be larger than the positively charged cations. Now the reason this occurs is that the electrons that leave the cations and go to the anions will make the anion bigger and will make the cation smaller. So we have two different sized spheres that we're trying to pack together. We also know that uh, two positively charged ions will repel each other and two negatively charged ions will repel each other. Um, so this kind of fight between trying to pack these atoms as tightly as possible as well as this charge neutrality will play a role in the crystal structures that are created. But first, let's take a look at the relative sizes of these uh, spheres, of these spheres that we're trying to pack. So uh, unlike the metals where we had all the same sized sphere, here we have wildly different sizes. So if we have a really, really small cation, we can only really fit two anions around it. And um, as that cation gets bigger, we can actually fit more anions around it. So if, if we had, you know, kind of three guys, this would be a slightly bigger um, cation. And this uh, figure you can find in your in your book it uh, tells you the relative stability of the different radii of cation to anion ratios. And so if we are able to take the radius of the anion and compare it to the radius of the cation, we'll be able to determine how many anions we can fit around a cation. And the way we do this is called the cation anion radius ratio. So it would be RC divided by 
R A and that's what these numbers are. These are the cation anion ratio numbers. And so if your ratio is less than 0.155, you can only form this type of structure. You can only fit two anions around a single cation. Um, if it's between 0.225 and 0.414, you can actually fit four anions around a single cation. And so this relative size between the anion and cations will change the type of crystal structures that you can make. For covalent bonds, we have something quite different. So the bonds are directional. And we call the bonding, we call this uh, directional type of bonding or the, the uh, change in the electron cloud, we call it bond hybridization. And there are different types of hybridization. So there's sp hybridization between s orbitals and p orbitals. And the way this looks is you'll have kind of two elongated lobes like this. And this angle is 180 degrees. And we call this, or this is termed, a linear type of bond hybridization. So if we were kind of to map out where the center of the atom was, it would kind of be like the nucleus would be here, and then the atom would be here. And this sp orbitals would be um, what's actually interacting with the world around it. And therefore, bonds will only be formed at the ends of these lobes. There's another type of bond hybridization called sp2 hybridization. And what this looks like is inside a single plane, you will have three lobes. Lobes look very similar, but instead of being 180 degrees away from each other, the angle is 120 degrees. And this would be a planar type of bond hybridization, meaning it will bond with atoms in this direction, in this direction, and in that direction. And then there's a, another type that we need to know, and we call this sp Three hybridization. And the structure that this creates is a tetrahedron. So you have one vertically. This is actually in three dimensions, like that. And then I'm going to kind of draw this one back like that. And you have this very similar lobes, except they're in these three dimensions. And the angle between two lobes is smaller, it's 109.5 degrees. And so this is termed a tetrahedron. And if you don't know what a tetrahedron is, just look it up online and it'll be able to tell you. So a common material that creates these um, sp3 kind of uh, bond hybridization is uh, silicate and silicates are all around us. Um, it's a very, very common material. And so what happens is we have this kind of tetrahedron like this. And we have oxygen atoms on the outside. And a silicon atom on the inside. Oxygen silicon. Now the silicon is creating this sp3 bond hybridization and it will bond with oxygen covalently. And you have this very distinct tetrahedron created because of that directional bonding. Now the oxygens have a charge of negative two because um, 
uh, on the outside, on the very outer edge, because it's sharing two of its electrons with silicon. And so the electron cloud is kind of in between um, these uh, atoms. And so it has kind of a negative charge on the outside. And silicon will have a charge of four plus because, you know, it's kind of giving or sharing um, four of its electrons with the four different oxygen that are around it. And if you add this up, so each one of these has two minus, two minus, two minus, you'll notice that there are uh, eight negative charges and only four positive charges. So this whole tetrahedron has a net charge of negative four. Now I told you we couldn't have this um, this charge, this net charge on something. And so these silicates will actually do one of two things. They'll either bond with other silicon tetrahedron and one silicon atom or two silicon atoms will share um, an oxygen in between. We call that a bridging oxygen. Another way that they will solve this charge neutrality issue is they will bring in different types of ions. So they'll bring in um, other ions that are just essentially pure ions that can donate electrons um, to the systems. And so you can get very complex and diverse crystal structures with these um, silicate materials.